This episode of Market Talk is brought to you by Growmark FS. Keeping up on the latest in ag is a challenge to say the least, but there are experts nearby ready to help. You'll find them at your local FS. You can trust them to bring you customized agronomic grain and energy solutions born of the latest thinking. That's because FS specialists receive continuous training that keeps them current on the latest trends, practices, and technologies. So you'll get local expertise that's both exceptional and up-to-date. Visit FSSystem.com to learn how FS is bringing you what's next. And joining us now here on Market Talk to take a look at Friday's trade action and wrap up the week of trade, we welcome back Christy Van On. She's with Van On and Company. Christy, great to have you back on the show. Always a pleasure. How are you today? Good. How are you? I am good, Christy. Thanks for joining us here today. Uh, just kind of want to start, take the thousand foot view of the market trade this week. We obviously had the big WASD report. We've had a lot of other uh, number of news items in the trade, hot inflation data. Um, man, we got so much going on right now. But I look at the markets. We leaked a little bit lower on Friday's trade with that dollar moving higher. But overall, I mean, we're still holding some pretty good levels here. It just feels like that depending on the day, it's one news item or the other that we keep trading in these markets, Christy. Yeah, I'm, <clears throat> I'm personally pretty disappointed with how grains are trading. Um, you're never going to hear me come out and say I'm like that ultra bullish individual, but uh, I definitely think that the market could justify going higher with the numbers that we got from USDA. So this is the third report in a row that we've seen friendly numbers for corn and we're about five cents higher than where we were prior to that first friendly corn report. So you're digesting that information and then you're unable to do anything with it, which is really disappointing. Uh, we got a friendly report here in um, soybeans and then you follow that up with a slew of private sales to China for this year's soybeans, which this market has been waiting for. And we finally got them and we got a huge one followed up by really great sales throughout it. And getting over a million and a half a million metric ton of soybeans to China over the last three days and the market can't do anything with it. And so it has been disappointing. We know that you have this harvest pressure that continues through this time frame, but overall, I think the numbers could justify it. You know, today, Friday, it's been a lot of Fridays that feel like that risk off stance that you come in here, people restabilize before the weekend and you do have that selling pressure show up. I also think that you probably have a little bit of that psychological $7 corn, $14 soybeans that's holding the market back as well. You went right where I was going to go next. It just feels like we can't bust through $7 corn, $14 beans. It just seems like that is this big weight that has been over this market for quite some time, Christy. And, you know, you, you mentioned harvest pressure. And I think some traders, you know, not wanting to maybe get long into the weekend with the headlines. But, man, I, I mean... $7 corn, $14 beans. It just feels like we've just been stuck here for, for months and months, it feels like, Christy. Yeah, I, I would say so, like corn for the last month and a half has been feeling like watching paint dry. It's just not mm -hmm. going to do anything. And, and that's okay. You know, to be honest, it's how corn, how soybeans are reacting right now is far better than if they were to come in here and drop like a rock through out this time frame. So it's not all that bad that they're not able to do anything with the information. It's just what comes moving forward. And I do think that USDA has been very proactive in their production cuts uh, leading up to this report, nailing down your kind of your harvested acres. And so I wonder if you're not even, you know, going to say USDA kind of say, hey, we're good for the rest of the year, November, December, maybe let's just play it off. Let's let those reports kind of skip through, don't really change much, and then come and really fine tune everything into the January report. And that wouldn't surprise me if you do see that, which could make the rest of 2022 a little bit on the quiet side for futures, given without, you know, some crazy things from Federal Reserve that we're going to start seeing here next month. And then everything that's happening with Russia and Ukraine, you continue to get those stories out there. It does sound like they want to go back. Russia wants to go back on their agreement uh, to ship out grain out of Ukraine. Um, and that might just be one of those, you know, hate to call them stunts because they have real consequences behind them. But it could be just one of those things that you continuously have every couple weeks of Russia coming in here and disrupting things out of out of that area. Yeah, very, very true. And I know that's got its impacts uh, in this wheat market uh, a lot as well. We'll talk wheat in a minute. 
I want to segue to the cash side of the market, though. For quarter beans, you know, we think about harvest ongoing, and we got other issues like the low water on the Mississippi and the river situation. We have the potential of a rail strike back on the table. There's a lot of things logistically going on. Basis, I know, you know, we're seeing a lot of basis issues along the river, yet some areas in the interior remaining fairly strong still. So I'd love just... You know, your thoughts with the cash side of things, what are you seeing and hearing, especially in your area there in the upper Midwest right now, Christy? Yeah, so in West Central Minnesota right now, we're kind of wrapping up bean harvest and uh, quite a few local elevators have non have now gone to cash only on delivery if they're not priced. You know, they're not even charging you for DP. They're not allowing that. Um, that's happened in the past before. Typically in the past before though, when you see those kind of situations, you're seeing some really, really unfavorable basis levels. This seems a little bit opposite. This seems like basis is still strong, but they just want it cashed out and they want to be able to move it right away. I think you look at kind of the unknowns that they're dealing with right now. Are they going to be able to get on the rail three months from now? Are they going to be able to ship it, you know, three months from now? And so I think that plays into that role. The nice thing is that we have favorable basis levels for the most part, even though they're forcing you to cash out. You know, things could be much worse. I've seen 75, I've seen 95 under for basis levels around here, and they are hanging around that 30 to 50. So you do see that they're not trying to kind of um, overcharge you. It's just that they want to get their ducks in a row. And I think that's what you're going to start to see is that situation. I also think you're going to see a stronger basis push in the beginning, you know, post harvest to end of the year, mm -hmm. just because they can get everything lined up. They might know everything before things get backlogged. And so I think those are all what you're going to deal with moving forward. We know that ethanol has been hit or miss. One thing though, when you look at some areas is that we've seen extreme drought through so many cattle areas. And so I do think that, you know, on the ethanol side of things, DDGs could be very, very helpful um, for that portion of ethanol profitability. And so I think the stories are there that you can line up and see favorable basis, but we have to remember that if you do have that disruption, even the littlest bit of disruption seems to kind of like snowball itself into a much bigger one. So I think the key here is being ahead of the game and being proactive when you see those opportunities in front of you. And I think that you may see some of those here into the December timeframe, especially for the corn market. Well, and thinking about, you know, this harvest pressure, and uh, we talked about this before, you know, farmers selling off the combine, uh, you know, what are they going to do? And, and to your points as well, I, I think it creates a, a few discussions maybe. Should I sell off the combine? Should I put it in storage? You know, with so many unknowns, I, I think it just it creates a lot of conversations once you uh, get ready to put that combine away in the shed and try to decide what you're going to do coming out of the field, Christy. Yeah, I think there's, you know, there's not always such a bad thing with paying for storage at an elevator. Um, one of my worst nightmares, though, is for somebody to put it in the elevator and say, eh, it's fine, I'll pay it, it is what it is, and not be proactive about it, right? You can't fall asleep on it, same situation, you can't fall asleep on it when it's in your bid. And so you look at Minneapolis wheat for uh, a good reason, is that producers that put it in there and were paying storage at the elevator, um, you saw a substantial move here in the futures price that was very short-lived. And, and that's one thing we capitalized on for producers that had that was make sure that you are capitally, capitalizing on this and selling some of that grain that's sitting there on storage. And I think that's that same situation with corn and soybeans. You, you're not guaranteed. You, obviously these markets can drop off. Obviously basis doesn't have to, to improve. But if you're going to put it in there and pay storage on it, don't just sit in there and pay on it and not pay attention to things. You need to act like it's still there on your farm and making those decisions. Well, and thinking as well as, uh, you know, there's opportunities for re-ownership too. There's so many different strategies you can have. You don't necessarily have to have the physical bushels either in your bin or at the elevator, Christy. Yeah, and that's there's tons of opportunity out there right now, and I'm not trying to sound like a broker by any means, but really there are tools that you can utilize really well. And you know, yeah. one of the things is going and looking at the different relationships between the wheat complexes. What kind of story do we have here? So being West Central Minnesota, um, there is more spring wheat around us than anything else. And you're looking at spring wheat options and you're saying, hey, we, we just came off a monster crop. Um, 
I want to be, I want to be part of it, even though I sold it. You can be looking at, you know, other kind of situations. You're got really dry concerns for winter wheat country. You obviously have the Russia Ukraine play for Chicago wheat. And so there's a lot of dynamics moving in there that you can do to capitalize on it and know that you're not completely at risk if you're taking non-marginal positions. Well, Christy, thinking as well about the broader commodity sector, we saw that dollar kind of weigh on things. <clears throat> I'm going to start over. <clears throat> you sound like me. <laughs> I know. Yeah. <clears throat> I'll get to edit that here in a little bit. All right. Three, two, one. Well, Christy, thinking about as well the broader commodity sector, the dollar as well, obviously moving higher on Friday. The inflation data we saw this week, the higher than expected CPI numbers, it still feels like that's a big, you know, thousand pound gorilla in the room right now when it comes to the grains, livestock, energies, you name it. And you alluded to some of the Federal Reserve things we could see coming up here in the next couple of months. But uh, it just, I think Friday served as a good reminder that inflation, recession, et cetera, is still here and is still an issue in this market. Yeah. I mean, when you break down numbers, Federal Reserve wants inflation down to 2%. That is a very, very low number compared to where we're at right now. So I think that you've had them make these aggressive moves and they've said, hey, we are making these aggressive moves. We are going to damper it. And for the longest time, they kind of preached on this soft landing, that that was the hope that they'd have the soft landing. You could see some bits of recession, but it, it wouldn't be anything major. And now we're into this time period where it's feeling a little bit harsher than anticipated, and we still see inflation not changing. And that's going to be a concern to this market. You look at what's happening over in Europe. So Europe came in and about three weeks ago, we had some major concerns that one of Europe's largest banks, a couple of them were in really bad shape. And you started to panic and, and you saw that they were saying, hey, maybe we need to pause on these interest rates for a little bit. And that was friendly to the U.S. because people started saying, hey, you know what, maybe this is maybe this is a get, good indicator that we can't move too fast and that we don't need to be raising rates like we are. And you kind of got that brief little bit of, of comfort. And then you start to go back and you say, nope, we still have these issues. Inflation numbers are still very poor. And you have heard over and over again from the Federal Reserve that they are going to fight inflation hard. And so it almost feels like they are still going to be on that path. We're going to find out soon. But all of these kind of have consequences. And when you look at higher interest rates, that is very detrimental to a, a producer here in America. You know, with capital, um, everything that you have, all your loan payments that you have on machinery, all of these interest rates are not a friend to the farmer. And so it, in a roundabout way, not only is it affecting how the markets are trading on the board, it's, it's affecting your bottom line. And you look at even out to next year for, you know, 2023 crops, there's some good opportunities out there when you look at it and you say, hey, with the interest rates where they are, with increase in costs, can I pencil these numbers at X price on X bushels? And I think that's a real question you have to be asking yourself because I think most producers are in a good spot right now that they can be a little bit patient on selling this year's crop. But next year's crop might be a whole different ballgame by the time we get there. Well, a great point there. And also with the dollar, uh, with that high dollar, it's impacting our export demand. And, you know, you alluded to it earlier, the sales to China on soybeans to round out the week, which were great. They were very welcome. But the weekly export sales for the past week were pretty dismal, Christy. We saw those numbers Friday. I mean, corn, lowest volume since 2012 for the week. Wheat was the week's worst since 2017. I mean, the export demand overall, I, I think that's a big concern. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, I think it's a concern as well. And so if you pick apart uh, USDA's numbers from this, this one, and we'll go back to wheat, for example, um, where we are when you break down exports is that USDA is forecasting that we are going to export over 200 million less bushels of wheat than we did prior to the Russia-Ukraine crisis. And I think that's an indication is that when everything started to happen with Russia and Ukraine, we were like, this is it. This is our chance to be able to ship this wheat. You know, we are going to do great things. Um, that's really going to help out. And we just, we didn't pick up any of the business. We continue to not pick up any of the business. And a lot of that plays into the dollar's role. 
Now wheat is available in so many different locations. It's a little bit of a different beast than soybeans, right? So China has us and Brazil for an actual soybean crop. You know, they can go to Argentina, but that is more of a byproduct than it is the actual crop. So they don't have as much freedoms technically. So you do need to see that crop out of Brazil materialize itself, but we do we are more expensive. And even when we are coming off a of fresh harvest, we're more expensive. And so we did see those sales, but you have to wonder if that's just not a hedge to get them to where they need to get um, prior to cutting the Brazil crop. Same situation for corn. So you pick apart those numbers and just see kind of export wise what we've done. And you're really having USDA put that dollar into effect. And if we're going to continue to look at interest rate hikes, the U.S. dollar has really been going side on side with that, that you do see that safe haven of people wanting to come in here and trade it uh, if they can to kind of take their money and put it somewhere. Christy, let's talk livestock before we run out of time as well. Friday's trade in cattle and hogs was uh, relatively mixed in the cattle market to lower. Hogs had a little bit of support there. I'd have to think that was on the back of another strong uh, weekly export sales number in pork. But overall, it felt like livestock just kind of succumbed to some of that outside market pressure and some of those demand worries possibly uh, on Friday to wrap up the week. Yeah, I think that's a, a concern is that they're closely following those outside markets and they have such a big influence. If you talk about the cash side of things, I think a lot of people are friendly when you look at the cash side for, for cattle markets, but it just seems to be stuck here right now um, that it can't separate itself from economic concerns. And I think you're rightfully so. You know, you look at situations, even when you look at the hogs and you, you get stories like Supreme Court um, putting up the Prop 12 and coming and talking about that, they're talking about it, they're looking at it, but it sounds like they're not going to have anything on it until next summer. So you get those kind of stories, but it's not enough to separate itself from the economic concerns that we have. Now, being in the Midwest is, is much different than coming in here and being on the coast when you talk about demand. So it's so hard for someone in the Midwest to think economically, I might scale back on, on meat consumption. That's a, you know, especially in our house, it's like, yeah. it's just not something you think. <laughs> and so, um, but it is a true situation for some of those other areas. And now we have markets that are flushed and they have so much um, plant-based meat situations that it is kind of a concern that you could see that economic worry switch them over to a plant-based diet, a plant-based meat meat source, and have that kind of change the demand structure. Right now, I think that the worries, the thoughts of what could happen are weighing on the market more than what is actually happening. So I think if you could get that monkey off the back, kind of get through this next interest rate uh, discussion from the Federal Reserve, I think that would be very beneficial for the, the cattle markets and the hog markets, because I do think they have the story behind them to be supportive. They just need to get past that. Well, Christy, great stuff. Great thoughts. Any other final thoughts you want to mention real quick before we run out of time? No, I mean, it's nice to see that these markets aren't failing off. But I would say, you know, if you're an end user and, and you really don't want these markets to take off, uh, look at that $7, look at that $14 target and look at those as breakout zones that if you can see these markets kind of get past those, there probably is more to come if it can get through those resistance points because the fundamentals are friendly. So I think that's what you need to be watching is kind of those dynamics. And then also, um, if you are putting your grain on DP, if it's on delayed price or, or you have some that needs to be going down, this basis level has been fluctuating extremely fast. And there's a lot of producers out there that if they just talk to their individual buyer, um, what they are posting is not necessarily what they would give you. And so I think that's a healthy discussion to be having that as far as if you do have a chunk of bushels that need to go by the end of the year tax purposes, uh, talking to them about that, because I think there are some basis pushes that just aren't being seen quite yet that are on the backdrop. Well, Christy, uh, if folks want to work with you and the team there at Van On and Company, what's the best way to get a hold of you? You can call us at 1-800-648-5494. And I know as well, you can find them online, vanonco.com. With that, Christy Van On, she said with Van On and Company, thanks for joining us today on Market Talk, and we'll talk to you again real soon. Thank you. And that's going to do it for Market Talk here today. Find us online, markettalkag.com. I'm Jesse Allen. Have a great afternoon.